Let's pray together. Lord, once again, we come inviting your spirit to fill this place. Lord, the spirit of truth, the comforter, the advocate. We ask, Lord, that in this moment you would um, open our hearts and our minds, that the words of my mouth, the meditations and thoughts of all of our hearts and minds together would be pleasing, would be acceptable in your sight, Lord. You're our rock. You're our redeemer. Amen. Two guys walk into a bar, and they order lunch, and the waitress says, well, what, what brings you fellas in today? And one man, one fellow, he says, uh, well, I guess you haven't heard. The mayor has just passed a law just yesterday to help out local restaurants during COVID. And it's a new law that says all adult males are required to take a buddy to lunch at a restaurant at least once a week. And it's supposed to help the economy. So every adult male is supposed to take a friend, a buddy, a male friend with him uh, to lunch at least once a week. And the other guy said, well, he's exaggerating. It's not really a law, he says. It's really more of a mandate. More of a man date. <laughs> Two guys walk into a bar. <laughs> and they're excited. They're high-fiving everybody as they walk in. They say, we want champagne. And the guy, bartender says, well, what are you guys so excited about? They go, because we're geniuses. We're geniuses. I go, what do you mean? We're, we're, we're so smart, we're geniuses. What, what, what do you, what, why do you think you're so smart? He said, we just finished a jigsaw puzzle. And the box said four to six years, but we did it in two. <laughs> I'm not going to tell another one. <laughs> but you know how many jokes start that way? Two men walk into a bar. Thousands and thousands of jokes start, two men walk into a bar. Now, Jesus didn't tell jokes, he told parables. He told a parable that two guys walk into a temple. Now, the difference between a joke and a parable is, is actually kind of a thin line sometimes, because when Jesus told a parable, it had a, a setup, and it also, you know, jokes have what we call punchlines. A joke is structured in such a way that you set up a situation like two people going into a bar or something else, and then they say something or something happens, and then there's a little twist. There's a little something that reverses what you're expecting to happen, something that surprises you, something that's silly or different or unusual. And, and that, that ending to the joke is called the punchline. Well, Jesus' parables also had punchlines. They had an ending that was not what was expected. They had a, an ending that had some punch to it, an ending that had some power to it, that reversed people's expectations. His parables often did not end the way people thought they were going to end. The hero was not who they thought the hero was going to be. Often it turned people's expectations upside down, and that's why I'm calling this sermon series Upside Down Parables. And this one in particular has sort of the same setup as a, as a joke, and yet it also has a, a point, a, a punchline. And he says, Jesus told this parable because there were people who were confident of their own righteousness. People who were confident in their own righteousness who then looked down on everybody else. We might call them self-righteous. People who were confident of their own righteousness and then looked down on everybody else. And here's how Jesus tells the story. He says, two men walk into a temple. Two men go to the temple to pray. A Pharisee and a tax collector. Now, these are about as different a people as you could imagine. Because a Pharisee was an extremely religious man. Religion. Religion was his life. The other, a tax collector, a man who was universally despised, hated. 
I've said before across the years, why did people hate tax collectors so badly? Well, a Jewish tax collector, a Jewish tax collector was working literally for the occupying enemy. A Jewish tax collector was collecting taxes from his fellow Jews that would then go to the Roman Empire to help pay the salaries of the soldiers who were occupying Palestine. So a tax collector was considered a traitor to his own people. He was working for the enemy and getting rich doing it, making a good living doing it. So people hated tax collectors. And so a Pharisee and a tax collector both go into the temple to pray. And the Pharisee's prayer, as Jesus described it, is almost comical in its self-congratulations. Thank you, Lord, that I'm not like other people. Thank you, Lord, that I'm so much better than other people. Thank you, Lord, that I'm so much better, that I'm so good, that I'm so perfect that I'm so righteous, that I'm so holy, that I'm so much better than other men. Other men like robbers and evildoers and adulterers and that disgusting tax collector two feet away from me. Thank you that I'm so much better than other people. Thank you, Lord. Because as you well know, Lord, I fast twice a week. Not once. Twice a week I fast. And I tithe everything. I tithe everything. Oh, Lord, you're so lucky to have me. (laughs) You're so fortunate to have someone like me. Man, I know, Lord, how grateful you are to have someone like me. Let me just say, Lord, you're welcome. You're welcome, Lord, that I'm so good, so perfect, such a a great person. I, I know you're so thankful that I exist. You're welcome, Lord. You're welcome. The tax collector, it says, came down with his head down, which, according to Jewish custom in the first century, the way you prayed was looking up with your hands extended. This is how you prayed in the temple. That's how the Pharisee prayed, like this. But the tax collector prays with his head down. It says he's beating his chest and saying, Oh, God. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, forgive me. Lord, I'm a sinner. Lord, I'm terrible. Lord, I've sinned. Oh, God, forgive me. Oh, God, have mercy on me. I'm the worst. Have mercy on me, Lord. Have mercy. Forgive me. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. And Jesus says, this man, it's the tax collector. The rotten tax collector is the one who left the temple justified. Justified. Made right. Made right with God. It is he who left the temple justified. There's the twist. There's the punchline. It's the tax collector who left justified because he says, those who exalt themselves will be brought down low. And those who humble themselves will be lifted up. Now this parable has a point that is echoed all throughout the New Testament, all throughout the teachings of Jesus. We, none of us, are good enough for God. None of us are perfect. None of us are sinless. None of us can count on our own righteousness to save us. None of us can march into heaven and say, here I am, God. I've done it. I'm perfect. I belong here. Open up the gates. None of us are good enough. All of us fall short. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone makes mistakes. Everyone fails. Everyone sins. Everyone does things they shouldn't have done. Everyone says things we shouldn't say. All of us leave undone things that we should do. All of us sin. And so we are saved not by our works, not by our deeds, not by our righteousness. We're saved by the grace of God. It's God's grace. It's a gift. It's not earned. It's not anything we can say we deserve. It's a gift that we receive. Grace is a gift. That's that's something that Jesus says multiple times in multiple ways. 
Paul says it multiple times in multiple ways. It's the, it's the cornerstone of, of our faith. It's the cornerstone of the Protestant Reformation. We're saved by grace through faith. But as we read this story, you know, and other stories like it, we might say, why did Jesus really have it in for the Pharisees so bad? What was Jesus' problem with the Pharisees? Why, why does he criticize them more than anybody else? Why is he so critical of the Pharisees? The word Pharisee means the separated ones. And they were the most religious people in Israel. They were the most religious people in all of Israel. Now let's think about that word for a minute, that word religious. Religion, religious. Linguistic scholars don't all agree on the etymology of the word religion or religious. Most seem to think that the root word means to bind, to bind, to tie, to connect. That religion is something that binds us, that ties us together. That that's the root word of the word religion. And of course, when we use the word religion, we talk about the religions of the world. The world is full of religions, all different kinds of religions. It doesn't just refer to Christianity. In the book of Acts, Paul, on one of his missionary journeys, ends up in Athens in Greece. And in ancient times, including the first century, Athens was considered in some ways the intellectual capital of the world. Athens was the place where the goddess Athena, the goddess of wisdom, was lifted up as the, as the goddess of that particular town. It was where Mars Hill, the Areopagus, was located, where the philosophers would gather on Mars Hill at the Areopagus and debate the philosophies that were prevalent in the, the Greek culture and the Roman Empire. Athens is a learned town. And when Paul goes, he says to the people of Athens as he gathers with some of the philosophers, he says, I can see that you're very religious. He says, I can tell this is a very religious town. What did he mean? Well, there were idols everywhere. There were temples everywhere. Temples to gods and goddesses. Athena and Zeus and Hera and Apollo and Aphrodite and on and on. There were idols on every corner. And so Paul says, you are a very religious People. It's a very religious town. And then he said, well, let me tell you about what I believe. So Athens is a religious town. And the Pharisees were religious Jews. They were very religious. They practiced a very strict form of Judaism. Now, they identified about a little over 600 laws of Moses in the Old Testament. And they were determined to keep every single one of them strictly. And, and some of them, you didn't have to work too hard to keep, like don't murder somebody, don't steal, don't commit adultery. Those they felt they were pretty safe. So they tended to focus a lot of their attention on some of the other rules, like the Sabbath, keeping the Sabbath holy, not working on the Sabbath. They had hundreds of rules about what constituted work and how to avoid work on the Sabbath. How to, you couldn't, you couldn't get water out of the well on the Sabbath because that was work. You couldn't tie a knot onto a bucket to get the water out of the well on the Sabbath. Women were forbidden from looking in the mirror on the Sabbath because they might see a gray hair and pluck it out and that would be work to pluck out the hair. And on and on, picky, 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 hundreds of laws. And one of the things, as I mentioned, I believe last week, one of the things that they said was forbidden to do on the Sabbath was heal. Healing is work. And that's why they got into conflict with Jesus. Because Jesus healed people on the Sabbath. Jesus worked on the Sabbath, and they called him a Sabbath breaker. They called him a sinner because of that, because he worked on the Sabbath. He healed people. And that brought him into conflict with the Pharisees. The Pharisees focused on rituals, religious rituals, like hand-washing rituals. Not like we wash our hands with soap to get rid of the germs. No, they didn't even know germs or bacteria existed. 
but they had a ritual of hand washing where they poured the water this way and that way and over and under and all kinds of it was a very ritualistic way of hand washing that they thought was a very way of practicing religion. They had the kosher laws, the laws that allowed what food could be eaten and what food was unclean, non-kosher. But they went to extraordinary extremes to make sure they didn't accidentally eat something that was non-kosher. For example, certain bugs were non-kosher. Some bugs you could eat, like locusts. Some bugs were forbidden to eat. And so the Pharisees would strain their wine with cheesecloth to make sure no stray bugs got in there, not because it was gross to eat a bug, but because bug meat wasn't kosher. And you wanted to make sure you didn't eat any non-kosher bug meat, like a gnat. Jesus lost patience with their way of treating religion. Jesus lost patience with how they saw what it meant to be a religious person. Jesus says this to the, in Matthew 15, 17. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. From out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. Not eating with unwashed hands doesn't defile them. Jesus says these kosher laws, he says it doesn't really matter what goes into your mouth, what food you eat. It just goes into your body, into your stomach, out your body. That doesn't he says, that doesn't matter. What matters is what comes out of your mouth, the words that come out of your mouth, words that can hurt or heal, words that reveal what's in your heart. Because if your heart is full of hatred and bitterness, then the words that come out of your mouth will reveal that hatred and bitterness. If your heart is full of lust or anger, your words will reveal that lust or that anger or that covetousness, or what He says, what goes into your mouth and goes out of your body, that doesn't matter. What, what matters is what comes out of your mouth. He says, whether or not you go through the hand-washing ritual or not, that's not what makes you clean. What makes you clean is what's in your heart. That's what makes you clean. But the Pharisees focused on proper rituals, food laws. These were vital parts of religion to them, and Jesus says they don't really matter. The Pharisees tithe, which is a good thing. Tithing is biblical. They tithe, but they didn't just tithe like a regular person. A regular person, if they made a living as a carpenter or a tent maker and they got money, they gave a tenth of that money to the temple. If they were a farmer, they gave a tenth of their crops to the temple. If they raised sheep, they gave a tenth of their sheep to the to the temple. That's what regular tithing looked like. But the Pharisees not only did that, they tithed their spices. If they had a little pot of mint or dill on the windowsill, they would take it and then they would measure out one tenth of the dill weed or one tenth of the mint and bring that to the temple so that they would make sure they could proclaim and proudly boast that they tithed everything. But Jesus well, Jesus just lays them out for this way of thinking. Matthew 23 is full of Jesus' critique of the Pharisees, and it's just one thing after another. Jesus says this in Matthew 23 to the Pharisees, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, men and dill and cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. These picky little practices that the Pharisees practiced, that they thought this is what it means to please God. This is what it means to be a good Jew. This is what it means to follow the laws of Moses. These insane little picky things. Jesus says you're hypocrites because you focus on these picky things and you ignore things like justice 
and mercy. You ignore things like the poor and the widow and the orphan and, and, and corrupt judges and, and systems that oppress people. You, you ignore the big stuff and focus on the little picky stuff. You focus on picky things and ignore the big commands of God, is what he said to the Pharisees. Well, thank God we Christians never do that. So it's a laugh at that. <laughs> thank goodness we Christians never get caught up in picky stuff. Thank goodness we Christians never get caught up in silly disputes over things that don't matter. Thank goodness we focus on justice and mercy and faithfulness and never get caught up in petty disputes over ridiculous things. Thank goodness we never do that. Oh, what's that we do? Oh, yeah, we do. The history of Christianity is unfortunately filled with lots of Pharisees, lots of Christian Pharisees. The history of Christianity is filled with Christians arguing about silly things that you, more silly things than you can imagine. In the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church, which of course at the time was really the only Western Church, the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church decided that you should add water to the communion wine. You should mix water with the communion wine. And the reason being, initially it was probably because, you know, just to make the wine go further, but there came, became a theological reason for it. And the theological reason that the church, the, mid, the medieval church was that um, when the spear went into Jesus' side, it says that blood and water came out. And so then and to this day in the Catholic church, a little water is added to the communion wine. But in the Middle Ages, there was a dispute. Warm water or cold water? They had a real fight over that. Warm water or cold water to be added to the communion wine. The medieval theologians debated things like how many angels could dance on the head of a pen because they were trying to figure out just how much space an angel took up. And thousands of other arguments about <laughs> arcane topics, silly topics that had no relevance to how you lived your life. The history of our faith is filled with silly arguments. And just in my lifetime as a pastor, just since I was ordained, when I was a, a young pastor uh, back in my, in my 20s, and there were still some of the older guys who were near retirement, who were 35 and almost 40 years older than me, guys in their mid-60s who had served ministry back in the, in the late 40s and 50s and 60s here in the Methodist Church uh, in Oklahoma. They told stories about what it was like to be a Methodist pastor here in the 50s and 60s. For example, if you were a Methodist pastor here in the early 60s, you were forbidden from wearing red ties. Just too flashy. Had to wear a dark tie, couldn't wear a red tie. There have been arguments in Christianity and Methodist churches over uh, how long the pastor's hair could be, whether or not the youth director could have a beard, drums in the church, guitars in the church. One that was, uh, I read about a church where they had a big argument over whether or not it was acceptable to bring to the potluck dinner, could you bring to the potluck dinner devil's food cake? <laughs> and they had a big argument over whether or not it was appropriate to bring devil, devil's food cake to the church potluck. You know, Jesus criticized the Pharisees because they put religion over relationship. They put religion over relationship. 
Now, is Christianity a religion? Yes, by the popular definition of religion, Christianity is a religion, just like Islam is, or Hinduism is, or Judaism is. Christianity is a religion, and we are bound together as a community. If the, if the word religion means to bind, yes, we are bound together as the body of Christ. So yes, it's appropriate that we talk about we are part of a religion, but really Christianity is a lot more about relationship. It's a relationship this way and this way. It's a relationship with God and it's a relationship with our neighbor. The heart of being a follower of Jesus, to being a part of his church, his ecclesia, his body of believers, is loving the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength and loving your neighbor as you love yourself. It is about relationships. Christianity, being a follower of Jesus, is about a relationship between us and God and a relationship between us and folks. <laughs> and it's not about some of the picky, silly things that we have gotten caught up in across the decades and the centuries. I think one reason Jesus told parables is he, he, he told parables rather than giving people lists of rules. <laughs> Jesus didn't say, now here, here are the rules to follow. He said instead, he says, let me tell you a story. He told stories continually, one, so we'd remember them, but also so that we would get the spirit more than, the, than turn it into a set of rules. The spirit of the story of the Good Samaritan, the spirit of the prodigal son, the spirit of the laborers in the vineyard, the spirit of all these parables that teach us the principles, the spirit of what Jesus wants us to learn. Now, even... Even a Pharisee like Paul, because remember, Paul, before he was the Apostle Paul, he was Pharisee Saul. He says he was raised by a father who was a Pharisee. He himself was a Pharisee. Fer Paul himself was dedicated to the same way of approaching the law as his fellow Pharisees, a very meticulous, picky uh, devotion to the minutia of the law. But when he became a follower of Jesus, you know, things changed. This is what Paul, former Pharisee Paul, says in 2 Corinthians 3, 6. He says, he, God, has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The Pharisee's practice was, was killing people. Jesus says, you take people and make them worse. That's what Jesus said to the Pharisees. He said, you turn them into worse people. Because this focus on the minutia, arguing over the minutia, and ignoring the big picture. You know, you can't see the forest because of the trees. Down in the weeds and missing the mountains, he, he says... You focus on the little stuff and you ignore the big stuff that I want you to focus on. Justice, mercy, righteousness, love of your fellow humans, uh, following and love in your heart for the Lord. He, he says you miss the big stuff because you're too focused on the little stuff. Now, as it happens, even after I had already planned this sermon and picked this passage, something happened in the last week that, um, well, hit a little close to this situation. Now, let me tell you up front, I don't, I don't like criticizing other churches. I don't like criticizing other denominations. I don't mind criticizing the TV evangelists because they're just trying to get into your pocket. Um, but I don't really like, I don't like criticizing other churches. Now, I'm a Protestant, a Methodist who happens to be also, I mean, a Protestant Methodist. Um, and I'm glad to be a Protestant. But the Roman Catholic Church has done many, many wonderful things. There's many wonderful Catholic Christians. When Jenny and I were living in Edmond and our kids were small and uh, we had to decide who would be our children's godparents. If we both died, who's going to take care of our kids? It was a Catholic couple that we chose to be the godparents of our kids. So many wonder wonderful, the Catholic Church does many wonderful, wonderful things. But there was a news story this week <laughs> that really emphasizes what can happen when you get down in the weeds. This week, news broke that a priest in Arizona, a 
priest in Arizona named Andres Arango. He'd been a priest for over 20 years, had been doing baptisms wrong. The way you're supposed, what you're supposed to say in the Catholic Church and in the Methodist Church for that matter, what you're supposed to say when you baptize somebody is, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's the appropriate language. But for 20 plus years, Reverend Arango had been saying, we baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He'd been saying we instead of I. Instead of saying I baptize you, he'd been saying we baptize you. And that's the way he had done thousands of baptisms. Well, the Roman Catholic Church has declared that every baptism he did was now invalid. Every baptism he did was now invalid. And that those people's salvation was now in doubt. And if those people who have now invalid baptisms had been married in a Catholic marriage ceremony, their marriage is now invalid too. Their children are now illegitimate. Because he said we instead of I. Here's the statement from the bishop in Phoenix. It is with sincere pastoral concern that I inform the faithful that baptisms performed by the Reverend Andres Arango, a priest of the Diocese of Phoenix, are invalid. This determination was made after careful study by diocesan officials and through consultation with the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in Rome. See, there, was a, there was a committee <laughs> in the Vatican that rules on this kind of thing, doctrinal issues, and they ruled that every baptism he had performed was now invalid because he said, we instead of I. And we say, are there any Pharisees left in the church? You know, you, you wonder if anyone at that office in Rome is familiar with Paul, or as they would call him, St. Paul, if they're familiar with St. Paul who said, the letter kills but the spirit gives life. I mean, it's just, it, sh it shows that the things that, that Jesus was irritated by, by the Pharisees, haven't gone away. There are Catholic Pharisees. There are Methodist Pharisees. There are Baptist Pharisees. There are non-denominational Pharisees. There are Pharisees in every denomination. There are Pharisees in the local church. People who somehow think that, that the picky, petty little things are the big things. As we used to say, they major in the minors. <laughs> they major in the minor things and forget the big stuff. You know, but Jesus wants us to think about the big stuff. Justice and mercy and love and hope and faith. Loving God with your whole heart. Loving people the way you want to be loved. Jesus wants us to, you know, I can't imagine Jesus in Arizona going, nope, none of, none of that stuff worked. Sorry, y'all aren't saved. Y'all aren't saved. Nope, sorry. Got the words wrong. Nope, doesn't work. I just can't imagine Jesus saying that. And I wonder if the Bishop of Phoenix and the, and the Pope can imagine that either. I, our focus, according to Jesus, is on the things that matter, the things that give life. You know, if you feel yourself getting caught up, you know, that old, it, it's still true, just say, well, what would Jesus think about this? What would Jesus say about this? What would Jesus do about this? When we ask ourselves those questions, we're in a pretty safe place. Uh, when we when we say, this is, this is the heart, and, and, and say, God, <laughs> I'm a sinner. <laughs> Have mercy on me. Show me the way. <laughs> Forgive me and show me the way. Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful for the words of Christ, for the stories of Christ that, that show us the way. And we ask, Lord, that um, you would help us um, to not get caught up in things that are silly and petty and ridiculous. Um, 
and to focus on those things that are of eternal significance, the things that, that matter in people's lives, the things that bring Christ to people's hearts. Amen.